So, uh, before we launch into uh, our next major classification of aortic catastrophes, Dr. Freeman had some excellent observations on the first half of the lecture, and I'm actually going to ask him to share those with us. Well, I, I, slightly different emphasis than me. I, I was going to say no, because it was a great lecture, but I had, I had practiced in pre ultrasound days and had a few of these go by. And, uh, the, the ones that are unruptured, it, it's really a crapshoot. It reminds me a lot of like diagnosing ICDs with headaches or PEs with chest pain. You really just have to think of it and do it. But the other thought that John pointed out is that a certain number of people have these and don't need operation yet. Like a surgeon will not there. Like, Mr. Sullivan, you have a AAA and in uh, two years you'll probably be dead unless you have an operator. And at the time that gets his attention, but then eventually he comes back to the emergency department when we put on that on. Has back pain and I probably half a dozen times just said, Mr. Sullivan, is your doctor ever told you have a AAA? And his eyes light up and like, Oh yeah, that's <laughs> really important. I got one of those. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and the whole course is clear because they're not ruptured, but they have symptoms from it, and it is getting bigger, and it's it never gets smaller. <laughs> and the doctor uh, has impressed upon him that it is going to kill him. It gets so, smaller right after a rupture. There, there might be <laughs> actual violence in just asking people. Just the same way I, I, I'm much better now about asking people if they had DVDs or DVDs than I was at the time when we couldn't do anything about them anyway. But the other thought was the people that are ruptured, you need to position yourself to be looked at in retrospect as it was your fault. You let this person die. It was your fault. Did you, uh, you know, it never became so clear to me. This is the doctor of ledger was when I, I suspected somebody of having a triple A and I sent him to CT. And uh, I was back there, like I tended to be looking at it with the tech as it came into the room, and there was a triple A, and I called her right from the CT scanner. And she came back down, as I said, it's a triple A. And she looked at me and she said, What were you thinking, Scott, when you ordered it? I said, Well, I was worried they had a triple A. She said, Why didn't you call me when you ordered it? Instead of two hours later. And it, it was really a great point. So once this crosses your mind, <laughs> and you start to look at this, uh, well, it's a little different now with ultrasound, because you may get to the diagnosis pretty much immediately. But there's not a reason to not engage them. You're not going to take care of this yourself. And you really want to have your whole chart be cohesive. Did you put lines in? Did you put a fold in? Are they ready to go to the operating room, or did you make the diagnosis and then have dinner and then add some more stuff? Is it all piecemeal? Is it cohesive? But people are really going to look at most of these since they don't do well. In that so uh, the key words there for me are position yourself for disaster. I think it's a little important. Position yourself for disaster. And which is really the same thing as positioning the patient for disaster. Getting well, that is the bottom line. I mean, these things will be good for the patient. And of course. Do them up front, but sometimes it, it's difficult to pull it off the side. So you can look okay. Yeah, these are really, uh, once you start thinking about this, when you have a patient who presents like this, and you have a clinical suspicion, it really is a four alarm part. <coughs> you need to get people involved. And you need to, that becomes, for now, the only patient under your care. Right now. Yes, ma'am. Uh, not Because I did everything that I could do.
Kumpulsu na abi. Your nurses have the most experience. You have to let your nurses know that even though you do these workups, we have a zillion people in here, this guy is the sick guy. This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. The way I say it is this is our only patient. Until he's in the OR, this is our only patient. I guarantee you, if you have somebody with a ruptured AAA in your, in your module or in recess, you do not have a sicker patient under your care. Right? And you do not have a more time sensitive patient under your care at that moment. Unless you have another patient with a ruptured AAA. Which just happened like that. You already the section, and call, I'm calling it the big rip, which puts me in mind of this. So these are the future fates of the dark energy universe, and I'm sure you're all aware. Well, maybe you're not doing this, resident and stuff like that. Recent discoveries of the role of dark energy in the universe. What what we used to think was is that the universe might be either closed, in which case uh, the amount of matter in the universe and the amount of gravitational energy is sufficient to cause the universe to stop expanding at some point in the future and then start to fall back on itself. And this model of the universe becomes a simple harmonic oscillator that just does this. And, and then we started to think, well, there might not be enough matter in the universe to close the universe, and it might just be what was called the hyperbolic universe as opposed to the perfect universe, and then we just continue expanding forever and forever. Uh, but now, more and more cosmologists are talking about this situation, the big rip in which the inherent dark energy in the universe, whose nature is still unclear to us, will continue to drive things apart faster and faster, because we now see the cosmic expansion is not slowing down, it seems to be accelerating. And this acceleration will happen at all levels of space-time. And so eventually, not only will galaxies be rushing apart, but stars will be rushing apart from each other, and star systems will be running apart from each other, and molecules and atoms and subatomic particles will be moving away from each other. And eventually, the whole thing will just go in what's called the big rip. The big rip. Will this have a significant effect on my work, so? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so you can see it's a sort of cosmic deception that will uh, eventually lead uh, to the dissolution of all matter. You'll end up with a situation where there will be not even any elementary particles, even they will be ripped apart. Fascinating, isn't it? But we're more concerned with this kind of big rip, right? Look at this image. This is just an amazing image. This is false luminary. And as usual, it's sort of spiraling around. You see how it's sort of spiraling around the aorta? This is a bad disease. And uh, I've had some triple A's in my career, like most of you will. But these, in particular, they seem to like me. They come in when I'm working. I don't know, they haven't been so bad in the last few years. <laughs> but especially the first two thirds of my career, I just, it's just a glitch. I don't know why. I just got a lot of them. Crummy used to make fun of me. And they, my all of them turned out very well. So, let's first, as usual, talk about the epidemiology. Most of them are older people. The mean age is 65. And this is an observation that is going to get you into a certain amount of trouble. Because it, it's not like AAA. AAA is an old class disease, right? Over 50, right? Your section, not so much, right? Anybody can have an aortic dissection. There are reports and there are series in the literature of little kids who have aortic dissection. Young people who live ways who have aortic dissection. That kind of thing. If you look at the International Registry of Aortic Dissection, which is still sort of the bottom line database for this, 6.5% of IRAD patients were less than 40. They had lower rates of comorbidities that might lead you to suspect that they were predisposed to dissection. They had higher rates of college and vascular disease and valvulopathy, including undiagnosed college and vascular disease and valvulopathy. These patients lose more life years when you miss the diagnosis, right? It's one thing to lose a nursing home patient. It's another thing to lose a gainfully employed father of four, right? Certainly it is to a jury, right? So these patients are more high risk. 
So, bottom line, if you would otherwise suspect the aortic dissection based on the patient's clinical presentation, but he's too young to have the dissection, you are about to make a mistake. It doesn't get you out of your Yes, sir. You're, you're also going to make a mistake in that this IRED database is not your patient population. Your patient population smokes crack and has an unbelievable rate of hypertension that's undiagnosed. That's correct. Which is going to predispose them to a higher risk of this, for sure. So just as a young, it has nothing to do with it. They have a higher risk for cardiovascular disease, hypertension, arterial sclerosis, and sympathomimetic use. So that's an excellent point. Never worth being cast by CPO. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Another excellent point. They all have painful pairs. <laughs> <laughs> a risk factor for aortic dissection is going to do a number of things. Three things, really. It's going to cause some sort of arrangement in the aortic architecture that changes the, hemo the balance of hemodynamic forces on the floor. It's going to increase intimal stress or cause an intimal defect, right? Or it's going to weaken medial integrity so that the section can propagate down the aorta. So if you look at risk factors, age can do all of these things, right? You get the tortuous aorta, they get their, uh, they get the uh, medial degeneration, just part of the, the part of the aortic or the uh, normal atrophic, shitty reality of aging, right? Um, and they have uh, weakened, uh, or they have an increased intimal stress. Right? Hypertension. Hypertension increases intimal stress. The bicuspid aortic valve, clearly these patients are predisposed to aortic dissection uh, because of their altered hemodynamics and their altered morphology. Aortic core patient, again, this is going to derange the normal hemodynamic and transmural forces that are operating on the aorta. Either Xanos and other kinds of collagen vascular diseases are obviously going to predispose to medial degeneration. And pregnancy, a little bit unclear, but you can cook up reasons for why it might affect all three features, right? Can predispose to aortic dissection. This was new to me, so I, I felt a little bit dumb about it actually. I was asked to prepare this talk initially for the Michigan Critical Care Conference, and Several months ahead of time, I started doing my homework. I guess I sort of had some inkling, you know, because I was seeing more patients where I was suspecting the aortic dissection. I've been sending them for a CAT scan, and 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 the and the, uh, the radiologist would say, "Well, no, he doesn't have an aortic dissection. What he has is an intimal aortic ulcer with some uh, medial propagation." And I'd say, "Well, that sounds like a freaking dissection to me." And they'd say, no, it's not exactly the same thing. Or they would say, he has an intramural hematoma, which can progress to aortic dissection. So as our, as our imaging resolution has gotten better, and our understanding of the disease has gotten better, we've seen the evolution of this concept of the spectrum model of aortic dissection, like the spectrum model of acute coronary syndrome. It's actually a spectrum of disease states. We're going to talk about that in a little bit of detail. The three components of the spectrum, more or less, from one end to the other, are the penetrating aortic ulcer, the aortic intramural hematoma, and the classical aortic dissection. So, penetrating aortic ulcer is pretty much what you can picture in your mind, just from the words. It consists of an intimal defect, usually associated with an arterial sclerosis, but not. Um, that has extended down the It's not propagating along the length of the aorta, so it's not a dissection, but it predisposes to dissection and can be identified on cat It's less common than either the intramural hematoma that we're going to talk about or the aortic dissection that we all know and love. Its etiology is unclear, but it's thought to result from the rupture of plaque can also re uh, result in a traumatic rupture of plaque. It's usually in the descending thoracic aorta, so it usually leads to a standard kind of situation. And it may progress to a characteristic variant of aortic dissection that has a much thicker sort of sclerotic intimal flap than the classical dissection. So that's the PA, the penetrative aortic The aortic intramural hematoma is a weird beast. It is blood that is in the media, but there is no clear communication with the aortic wound. It's actually more common in the penetrating aortic ulcer. 
Uh, and in fact, it may be the actual diagnosis in up to 30% of patients who are diagnosed with AD, and you can see how this would be. The CAT scan is going to show this intramural hematoma, which may extend a certain distance, right, a certain longitudinal distance along the aorta. No intimal flap is in evidence on the CAT scan, say, but that's often the case with the aorta section. CAT scan can often miss the actual site of the intimal flap, the actual site where the media has broken down and the <coughs> egress of blood into the intimate and the media. This is thought to result in the rupture of intramural basal basal arm, right? Possibly from increased uh, interaortic pressures, possibly from trauma, possibly from arterial sclerosis. Again, there's no true connection with the true movement. You won't see Doppler flow in these patients. <coughs> Right, like you will with an aortic dissection or a PA. But it's easy to see how over time, right, this bad boy could erode its way into the lumen. Now you have a communication between the high luminal pressure and this defect in the median. And then it can start to progress down the median, propagate down the median, and have a true aortic dissection. But uh, you can also see how it went below the this way, or both this way and that way, in which case. You have a pre rupture, which is never a And then finally, there's the classic aortic dissection characterized by an intimal flap and a column of blood under aortic pressure that has obtained egress into the media and is propagating along the line, right? What we always think of as an aortic dissection. Propagation of a longitudinal false movement. Uh, flap arises in the areas of high tension. You all know this or should know this. The right lateral wall of the ascending aorta and the proximal segment of the descending aorta, but it actually it can occur anywhere. These are just the areas that are most morphologically and more dynamically favorable to the development of the classical section. And so we have the spectrum of disease, which you might speculate is going to move in this manner. Uh, actually, how does a PA lead to an IMH? I guess you feel over. Uh, IMH can clearly lead to dissection. IMH can lead to PAU, and PAU can lead to dissection. This is all handwritten. Nobody actually knows the natural history or the rate at which these lesions progress the one to the other. There just isn't enough data in the literature to tell us. Yes, sir? Do you get any sense of the ability to differentiate between these is limited by the thickness of the slices done by CT and that we're not doing slices like we are for MLI where we stack them closer together? Sure. Absolutely. Does anybody do other slices to look for this disease? I don't know. Sorry. Clearly, so the, the reason that we're able to recognize the spectrum of disease, you know, it's amazing. People have been cutting out chunks of diseased aorta for decades. We've been like cutting out pieces, chunks of people's aorta and putting in like grafts for patients with, who are diagnosed with the section. And yet, this is all very, very easy. You'd think they would have been looking at those chunks of aorta. <laughs> like, if I was to picky, I would like put those in jello and slice them and look at them under a microscope. You'd think that they would have done that. You'd think that this, that this histological variation would have been identified previously, right? You wouldn't have, you wouldn't have needed CT. But nevertheless, the identification of these variants has basically come along with the increased resolution of, cat, of CT. But we don't know enough about them yet, or really, or at least I don't know enough about them. I'm looking for the literature, I don't think anybody knows enough about them, to say what the actual natural history of these three entities is relative to each other. Yes, sir. The two different animals of dissection and aneurysm are, are, are real different, but I, I have a conceptual overlap in my brain. We have pseudoaneurysms, is it just a, is it partly a dilated IMH? I think that's a, no, not a dilated IMH, it's a dilated PAU. PAU. It's a di this is, so you can see how this could lead to the development of a false aneurysm. But then I don't know if those are really the same animal, or if it's more like yeah. an aneurysm, if two aneurysms are more like aneurysm than dissection. I don't think, suppose. I don't think we know or about the thing. natural history of any. So do these, do these progress to pseudo aneurysm? Do they progress to pseudo aneurysm, or do they always progress to aortic dissection? Sometimes they don't progress at all, we know that. 
sometimes you just get healed spontaneously and they'll often be managed expected. So what, what's the rate at which these progress as pseudoaneurysm, if at all? I don't know and I'm not sure to play that. Yes, sir. So based on what Dr. Freeman said, would it be reasonable if we suspect this diagnosis to order a CTPE protocol to get the... To get the yeah, we're not in control of that. <clears throat> we don't tell the radiologists how to run their machines. But we have to take what they give us. If you got this on the CT, let's say you think this one's just perfect, would you manage it differently? Yes. These do, these do get managed differently. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But how they're managed is not my decision. And it's not our decision. If I make that, so because it's kind of like MI. Right? Remember when it used to be on MI and MI? Now it's just acute coronary syndrome. Over to you, cardiology. Right? It's the same way with acute aortic syndrome, in my mind, in my opinion. If I diagnose an acute aortic syndrome, I send it to the acute aortic syndrome guy, and I work with him to manage the case. Because I'm not going to fix any of this. My job is to diagnose it and refer. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Just like it's my job to diagnose and cure an acute coronary syndrome. Does that make sense? I can initiate therapy in the ER, and I should, in conjunction with my specialist, who's going to help me manage the case. Actually, I'm going to help him manage the case. So, clinical presentation. Uh, just like aortic aneurysm, it's a diagnostic challenge. And there are multiple pitfalls that are going to need you to screw up. The major cause of ED litigation. Dr. Freeman said, told me that, intimated that maybe I was showing too much personal information up here, but I will tell you that uh, I've been sued only two or three times, and one of them was for an aortic dissection. The guy dissected a month after I saw him. It was my fault. Right? So these are a major cause of, of litigation. If you see a patient and he dissects any time between now and doomsday, expect to get a letter. Greetings, you are being sued. Right? These are a major, major cause of the litigation because they have such devastating effects. And they can take so many life years away from the patient. Of 5 million chest pain patients in the United States, only 2,000 have a section. That's not good news. It's a needle in a haystack situation. Right? We know that most of our chest pain patients are nothing. Right? More than will have acute coronary syndrome. And it's a very small number of them will have a dissection. And your chances of missing it are good. The classic features, remember, it's Latin for 15%, right? <laughs> They're usually absent. Less than a third of cases, probably less than that. Again, like AAA, often an incident will find it. Here's an interesting point from literature. Physicians correctly suspect aortic dissection in 15 to 40% of cases. I guess this range is like, you know, so this separates the, the, the men from the boy, right? They're 15 to 40%. Right. Here it would be 40%. I'm saying it receiving. We would correctly suspect they were in the section of 40% because you know, this was so good. Right? You guys aren't buying it. <laughs> Clinical presentation. Pain is the most common presenting symptom. Right? Most patients recall an abrupt onset of the patient of the pain, but not all of them. And you read all this stuff about is, you know, adjective. Is it ripping? Is it tearing pain? It has to be ripping or tearing pain, right? It has to be ripping, tearing pain, work pain, never. Ripping, tearing, sharp, all through the whole body. Nice pain. <laughs> all alone, right? Pain alone is, is, is what you're interested in. Here's the real problem. Most patients don't actually have pain. Or many patients will not actually have pain. Most patients will have pain. Many patients will actually not have pain. Right. So again, clinical, the clinical history is not going to help you rule it in or out. Just because the patient doesn't have pain doesn't mean they don't have it. Migratory pain is highly suggested by present in my word cases. We just talked about this. Up to 5% of patients do not have pain. That's why you should not be lost. Chest pain, you would think would be a fairly classic feature. It is more common in large dissections. About 80% of patients have chest pain with extended heart dissections, 63% in distal heart dissections. Interscapular pain is considered a classic finding, right? Warning. 
right? If you're relying on the presence of intrascapular pain to help you make the diagnosis, you're about to screw up. IRAD found back pain in only 53% of patients. About half. Uh, it's more common in sections that are distal to the subclavian. It's not so common in ascending sections or even ascending sections. It's actually large. Abdominal pain is poorly characterized uh, in association with uh, dissection in the literature. It's also poorly characterized by the patient, usually as well. Uh, abrupt chest pain, uh, this should say abrupt chest pain, question line, abdominal pain, or other symptoms should be suspicious. So it needs to be part of your differential for the abrupt onset of chest pain and or abdominal pain in any patient. It's often associated with a malperfusion syndrome. A malperfusion syndrome in a patient with pain should always make you think of an aortic catastrophe, either an aortic dissection or a AAA, because malperfusion syndromes can present with both of these, right? Chest pain, dead heart, the association with the acute MI dissection in the coronary arteries. Abdominal pain, dead bowel, we can see this in both dissection with the uh, dissection in the mesenteric circulation or in AAA, it can be seen. Flight pain, dead kidney, and stroke, dead brain, right? So pain plus a malperfusion syndrome. People say that dissection is the chest pain and uh, disease. Right? So chest pain and a stroke, chest pain and abdominal pain, chest pain plus a pale leg, right? That should make you think about an aortic catastrophe and it should make you think about an aortic dissection. So here's a patient who had a dissection and the pain was so bad it caused his penis and scrotum to retract that when he was at Actually, you can see that this is a dissection that's this this is a dissection that's propagated into the SMA. This is the false loop. This is the true loop. So you got problems here, right? Here's a patient who's going to receive the dead out unless corrective action is done. So the chest pain, sudden onset of chest pain, sudden onset of that pain, and something else. Chest pain that migrates from here to here, right? From here to there. Chest pain started here, then it went into my back, now it's going down, and my leg doesn't work, right? So, better not be like Mel Herbert, who tells the story, and it's like, I this pain, it's like, what is this? Some sort of bizarre rickettsial disease? No, it's a dissection. <laughs> when, when things don't sort of compute, and you have this sort of, uh, this patient who presents with these sort of like, Unrelated symptoms, you need to start thinking about things like that. <coughs> yes, sir. Can you gain any benefit by the acuity of the symptom? Or can people have symptoms? That they have subacute dissections. Yes, they do. Well, yes, they do. <laughs> no, you're screwed. You're totally screwed. <laughs> right. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, patients can have subacute dissections. They can take a what long time. What percentage of time is that? Pardon? I'm not sure, okay. but a significant percentage of the time. Patients can, in fact, this is a beautiful illustration by Fiari, uh, which uh, is like one of those sections of the debate you should have taken, <laughs> um, where there's a dissection, they call it the dissecting aneurysm needle, aorta, and you can see that the intima has been peeled away from the lumen and stuck into the opening of that subclavian artery. Right? Pretty cool, like a hideous sort of Taking real reaper sort of. <laughs> huh? Taking it for later. Yeah. Syncope. Not just in IRAC cases, more common in ascending dissections. Um, they think it's probably barrel receptor mediated. Guess what? Aortic dissection plus syncope is a worse diagnosis. It's a worse diagnosis for aortic dissection. It's a worse, di uh, worse prognosis for syncope, too. Right? So, yes, if your syncope is due to a aortic dissection, you do have a worse prognosis. Absolutely. More likely to have tamponade and neurovascular badness, spinal cord, and stroke, which uh, Aortic uh, dissection induced syncope without pain. They say the standard of care is probably to miss the diagnosis. Uh, so, 
Don't be that guy. You want to consider aortic catastrophe in any patient who presents with symptoms. Right? In an older guy, you probably need to think more about AAA. And in any patient who presents with symptoms, at least ask yourself, could this be an aortic dissection? And then proceed accordingly. Remember, all plus CDP equals badness until proven otherwise. Other neurological presentations, 17 to 20 percent of the time, then you see them uh, more frequently seen, obviously, in proximal dissections where stuff takes off in the head of the brain, right? Um, if you have pain plus neurological features, right? Most strokes don't present with pain. So if you have a stroke that presents with pain, you better be thinking about an aortic dissection while you're trying to present right? It wasn't such a good period of day. This time it's not. That's time. Anyway, hey, bottom line, think about the aorta with chest pain and something else. Positive review of systems, right? A sort of disparaging term that we use in a lot of patients. They the patient have a positive review of systems for a reason. Because the big super highway in the middle of their body, the great big artery in the middle of their body is screwing up, and all the organs that are attached to it are screwing up too. Maybe that's why they have a positive review of this. Old blood CP, or if you find yourself at the bedside of the sick patient saying, What the hell is going on here? Right? You need to think about things that connect things one to the other. Brain plus chest, what's the connection? Right? Chest plus mesenteric ischemia, what's the connection? Right? Well, the connection is the aorta. So when you find yourself confronted by one of these patients, you ask yourself the hard question Could this patient have an aorta attached? Physical exam, your exam sucks at picking up the section. Here's a comment. Right? There are no physical exam findings that are going to get you out of the weeds here. Probably not your fault. The classic exam findings are usually not present. So again, <laughs> you come up to me and tell me, yeah, no salus pedis pulses are present. We're all good. <laughs> it's like the Mayhem guy. You see the Mayhem commercials? I like the one where he's the blind spot. You see the one where he's the blind spot? It's like, I'm your blind spot. You know? And he looks in the, the side of the mirror, he's like, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I think of now when one of you comes up and tells me, face has got your salad, feed his pulses, and we're all good to go. The exam cannot rule this in or out. Um, pulse deficit, it is highly suggested that it's present, but it's often not present. It's usually not present. If it is present, the patient has a worse prognosis for reasons that I think are too high for you guys to cook out. Diastolic murmur. It's actually not helpful. It has a lousy sensitivity and specificity as one of those classes in the third type. It's obviously more common in type A, more likely to involve the uh, movement of the aorta. Blood pressure may be high, may be low, anything is possible. All right? So if you're relying on the presence of a high blood pressure to tell you that, or a really, really low pressure to tell you that the patient has an aortic dissection rate or they are catastrophe, you're missing the boat. Look at this. Half of patients are hypertensive in the higher end. Half. Because I don't know about you, but when I think of aortic dissection, I think of the guy with the ripping, tearing chest pain going to the back that started while he was having sex and he had a blood pressure of 220 over a million. That's the picture in my mind of a person with aortic dissection. And that's not what you get. That's what they told me in medical That's what they told me in medical school. Well, they told me a lot of silly shit in medical school. <laughs> <laughs> it was good at the time. More than a third of them are normal intensive. It's crazy. And hypotensive 8%, guess what? Guess what? These patients do worse. These guys right here, <laughs> right? So you have an aortic section that comes to you and it's hypotensive already, you are in the weeds. Blood pressure is not helpful in making a diagnosis or informing your <coughs> image. Shock, present again, about 8%, totally non specific, due to ADD, guess what? Worst prognosis. Go with God. Right? You're going to be in trouble when you get going. Focal neurological deficit. Obviously, it's going to be non specific, but chest pain or abdominal pain plus, we've already talked about this, plus a focal deficit equals 80 until proven otherwise. Again, pain plus abdominal perfusion syndrome. Think aorta. Do not thrombolize or anticoagulate patients with chest pain plus a focal deficit. So when the patient comes in for the stroke pain, you know, the, the transfer, right? 
You're supposed to activate the stroke pager and write, and they come in and say, yeah, I can't, I can't talk, I can't find it. And I've got this horrible chest pain which is now going down into my belly. Do not thrombolize that patient. Right? You might want to share that information with the neurology before they thrombolize the patient. Chest x-ray. Uh, so again, part of that picture in my mind of the patient with the aortic dissection, he's got a media sign in the size of Nebraska. Right? And he's got a pleural cap, and he's got a tracheal deviation, he's got a left pleural occlusion. He has it all. Has it all. When I get his chest x ray, those are the things I'm going to see. Is that enough? Uh, why did he get assigned 20%? That's not what I was taught. Right? Abnormal aortic contour, okay, maybe half. How many of our patients without aortic dissection have an abnormal aortic contour? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Right? Abnormal cardiac contour. How many of our patients at Detroit Receiving Hospital without a dissection have that normal cardiac contour? Totally non specific and insensitive. Calcification and displacement. How many of our patients, et cetera, et cetera? Right? Diffusion. Okay? Diffusion always raises that contact risk. Right? When I see an infusion on a kid, who wants an infusion? Right? It's always something bad. It's just a question of how bad the badness is. Right? So, fusion should always be a red flag. Get this. No abnormality. Such or safety in here. Normal chest x ray. No abnormality. Or maybe there's an abnormality that you just don't see because it's not going to jump up and get you, right? It's not the mediastine in this wide. It's not the big old diffusion. It's not the big, it'll be something subtle, right? You'll only see it later when it's pointed out to you, the jury. <laughs> right? Something you really saw. So, this is bad news. Normal chest x ray does not rule out the diagnosis. Cool. There you go. There's my picture, right? That's my picture of an order perception. But that's not the usual picture of an order perception. I think I'd like to be involved. Ultrasound. Alright, so there's been a lot of talk about. And I just never got it. So I, I, I think that this is an overrated test. I think it's a waste of time. So here you go. You take the patient with a suspected dissection. You snow the percentage of analgesia. You ran the tube down the throat. Watch their DPD piece skyrocket. And then you use the probe to the side to paper the thin exterior of the, uh, the disintegrating aorta so you can get some pictures, right? And then you get lousy use of images and pretty often you go to CT anyway. This is what's happened every time I been asked to use this modality. This, it may give you some information, but information is not always <coughs> what you need, right? What you need is something that's going to help you make better decisions and help you get the patients where they need to be. I think this is a completely overrated test. I, I don't use it in a word of section. Um, any comments on this? Because this seems fairly contentious to me. So I'm trying to go to a contentious issue. What? I'm talking about TED. But the, the, the time of CU flows when the bullets have died with not time appropriately for a study and the CT was not very useful within the PJR and the images that were made were very helpful. That's some of the truth about that. Honestly, I haven't found it to be useful because there's very few people that know how to do it and do it properly, and yeah. even fewer that know how to interpret it properly. The CEO so doctor was right there, did it right there, came right away, and they were able to get it done. But that's like, you know, any equal one on that, and your guys' experience is much more fast. It's not as difficult to have to Yeah, I. Sometimes it's really because they do different operations and other results. Well, so I think it's really operative that sometimes it's a little bit of a Yeah, I've never had a, I've never had a good experience with it, and I I I steer clear. I I don't think it helps me make better management disposition decisions for patients. Here's your first line imaging in the emergency department is is CT, and I remember when it wasn't right. So my first patient in the emergency department ever. Remember I was talking about him. My first patient as an emergency physician ever. This is our patient with a non-specific chest pain. So, 
He was also my first M&M. &M. <laughs> my first patient ever was my first M&M. &M. And maybe Bob remembers this. Uh, and uh, so I, so my first lecture, my first lecture in this room ever was on this topic because it was an M&M &M on that guy, right? And uh, and in, at the time I gave that lecture, CT was kind of, CT was like, yeah, well, not really. What you really need is a TEE and an aorta. I remember that. That's how old I am. <laughs> I remember that kind of craziness. The CT has become first line. The sensitivity of uh, helical CT for dissection, for the presence of a dissection of, of, of an acute aortic syndrome, approaches 100%. It's rapid. It's available. Um, the reconstruction methods are just getting to be amazing. Sorry for the question. The disadvantages are a contrast load. I mean, these patients do not like a contrast load. There's poor information on the flap and poor information on the valve function. Yeah? When you get a CT using contrast before you get a VU and an exam, yeah. I and think in what conditions? Yeah, I think, yeah, absolutely. They don't demand it? I think what depends on what depends on the acuity of the situation. So, like, what? Yeah. But it's not a lot of common amount of patients. This is good. Okay, so if you went to radiology, but I knew about it. Yeah. It's one of those. Yeah, it's one of those balance the risks and benefits, and yeah, and be ready to stand tall. Okay. Wrong. That's why we get paid good ones. <coughs> Ooh, so this is the classic thing. I like them better when they have that sort of yin yang kind of thing going on, you know, which you will often see. Right? That sort of like yin yang appearance between the false woman and the true woman. It's the towel of dissection. Kind of thing. But anyway, this is pretty clear what you got here. This is the false woman. Thank God, this is not the false woman. So this is the false woman, and you can sort of, you know, clearly see the distinction between them. This is but pretty clear. MRI, the magnetic chamber of the human, excellent resolution and accuracy. You get, you get information about the flap, you can get information about the valve function, they can do this sort of same thing with it. Um, you can uh, get actually a very, very complete picture of the hemodynamics and valve function and cardiac function. You can see if there's branch vessel involved. You can see where the where the you know where the order the order section is propagated to. Um, uh, so and you can also run some really excellent codes. This is very exciting, <laughs> memorable. You can really forge some memories there. <laughs> so you know uh, this is not a first line imaging modality. This is something that you want to avoid for all of the most stable patients. When you've already got cardiothoracic surgery on board, more hands to hold on to as you all go down, kind of thing, right? This is something you can want to avoid. So, moving on to diagnostic, more diagnostic studies, including the lab. I can't believe I did this in 45 minutes. The critical care test. I was that 20 minutes ago. Wouldn't it be great if there was something like a B dimer? Well, it's funny you should ask. This is a uh, current topic in emergency medicine. There are multiple studies that suggest that AD may be a useful screen. I think you actually wrote that. Um, that D dimer may be a useful screen for your section. People have been talking about this. There's a recent meta analysis that suggests that D dimer would uh, cut off something in this area. Maybe a useful screening tool to identify patients who do not have a little section. Of course, that's not the goal. The goal is to identify the patient who probably does have a dissection. And as you might imagine, the specificity of the dimer is horrible because the specificity of the dimer is always horrible, right? Um, so, uh, also, it's a part of the prediction of the But nevertheless, this is an active topic of investigation. The problem is, is that unlike the situation with being a strong embolism, there is no evidence of a robust strategy for using D-dimer in the section like there is in the Some of you think that it's 
I'll know that the cluster needs to be either. I actually do. I think when it's used properly, it's dynamically valuable. I understand it's always used. So, what we need is some sort of decision instrument that we can use, like a well criteria or a perk rule, which is actually used in tickets and tickets and all words, or uh, to use in conjunction with the DNA, but no such instrument has been validated. Right. So, there's no rational approach to using it. I don't have I don't have in front of me a rational, validated approach to using D dimer to select patients for imaging when I suspect they were essential. Now, what's going to happen, you know, the way that would work would be I would have some sort of decision instrument that would let me decide whether the patient was high risk, low risk, or no risk. And then if they were low risk, I would get the D dimer or some other thing that you test, and it would it would say, yeah, this patient's fine. He's, the test is negative and he's got dorsalis penis pulses, he can go home, right? <laughs> You're good, right? That's, that's the way I would use it, right? Or I would presumably use it if such a, a method existed. There are some other markers, plasticity, muscle, myosin, heavy chain, elastin, right? But the bottom line is that these are not great for primary. As of 2011, it's your clinical suspicion that drives the decision to manage, literally. EKG. So this is where I had to learn something from the literature. Um, STEMI is present in five to seven percent of aortic dissection. However, aortic dissection is present in only a vanishing small number of STEMI cases. So I have always had this thing where the patient presents with a STEMI, right? And we're going to, especially in the days when we probabilize more patients, it's like. You, you've got, before you get that patient to happen, you've got to get a chest x-ray. You've got to look before you go in there and do something that's going to make the dissection worse. But actually, most patients who present with a STEMI don't have an aortic dissection. Now, a small number of patients with a STEMI have an aortic dissection, a small number of patients who have an aortic dissection have a STEMI, but almost all patients who have a STEMI don't have an aortic dissection. Does that make sense? The number of patients who present with a STEMI who actually have an aortic dissection, a contraindication of mobilisis or organization, is actually vanishing in small. And so what the literature is saying, which is not what I always thought, what the literature is saying is, is that when the patient presents with a STEMI and no focal neural or pulse test that it treats as a STEMI. Anybody here gotten a CQI for getting a chest x-ray on a patient before something like that? that? I do. <laughs> and boy, I gotta tell you, I thought I was on the side of the angels on that one. I made a pretty good argument. And actually, they actually no build me on that, but I was wrong, according to this literature. According to this literature, I was wrong. Really? I mean, <laughs> Some good <laughs> <little magic. laughs> So what would the CQI look like if the patient can't focus on the near infection? That CQI should go to the intervention. But the individuals are happy to find the infection. MPEs? Yeah, quite a few more than happy to take them. Over 30% of patients with aortic dissection have no EKG findings, so sleep well, right? Uh, and those EKG findings tend to be completely honest. So the bottom line is EKG doesn't help you make a diagnosis. Let's move on to management. So we're talking about a syndrome. And this question came up earlier. Management's going to be a little bit different depending on where you are in the spectrum of disease. So, first talking about intramural hematoma. Actually, if you have an intramural hematoma in the descending aorta, most authorities, not all, but most recommend surgery. Uh, and medical therapy for the descending patient seems to be the order of the day. But this is actually, I do surgery. Uh, again, this is not up to us. This is not a decision that we're going to make, right? So you're not going to say, yeah, you've got this descending from the so I'll just do it either. That's why don't we have thoracic surgery, right? That's not your decision. You're going to get a thoracic surgery involved. Did you have that? Did you get surgery? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Because if it was my intramural hematoma, I own that hematoma. 
it's mine. I get to make the decisions about it. Right? It's mine. And no, I'm not going to get it around. You know, I, well, at least not right away. I'm going to wait and see how things go. <laughs> Even if it isn't the same much. That, but that's me. I kind of like the order that got me. Even if it does happen. Uh, PAU is a little bit more controversial, uh, and there's no clear approach in the literature as of 2011 to how we should handle these, even depending on where they are. Again, you're going to get a cardiothoracic surgeon involved, some sort of emerging theme, right? Uh, even if you decide to admit them to medicine, that's going to be a decision that you make in conjunction with a cardiothoracic surgeon. Yeah. And aortic dissection. As you all know, right? The aortic dissections basically come in a couple of flavors, and their management depends on which flavor you have. Although, not absolute. So, again, well, this patient's got a CMB, right? He's got a descending dissection. Dissection is right here. So, he doesn't need surgery. So, I'm going to admit to MICU and let them do it. Well, you may very well admit to MICU, but you're still going to get a cardiovascular surgery. Right? Because some of these patients actually do go to surgery. Right? It's the surgeon who is the disciple. Which means the surgeon should come see any patient with AD. And depending on where you work, you may need some luck with that. And so this was the part where I was going to stop just for a minute and get some feedback from the attendants on, on how you're, because it's been a while since I've seen one. Thank goodness. So how are you guys handling these now with cardiothoracic surgery? Because it hasn't always been easy to get a cardiothoracic surgeon ex excited or even involved in these cases for me. What's your approach to this? They're you know, still making that call. call. What? They're still making that call. Really? You've got to get a vascular surgeon. Not a vascular surgeon. But I wanted to distinguish between cardiothoracic surgery, you have a slide up there, or vascular surgery. My impression of vascular surgeons is they handle blood vessels that are not the main one. Right. I'm not going to do anything with the aorta. That's not their gig. So there, it's going to be a cardiothoracic surgery. I agree. I, I disagree, actually. I disagree. No, I'm talking about here at the Detroit Medical Center. It's yeah, going to be a cardiothoracic surgeon. I, I called the cardiothoracic surgeon one night, and he made me sit down with the CT and be very specific about where the actual dissection was, whether it was above or below the aorta. And it happened to be that it was or above or below the diaphragm. It happened to be that it was below the diaphragm. He was off the base. So it's a call of general surgery and vascular call. Again, you made the call, and that's his decision, and he's on the hook because he was involved in this case. But you still are going to make the call. Right. Dr. Green, my best ally is the attending surgeon that's not here for general surgery. They know these people, they're all friends, they all hang out together. And uh, I just went through this last week and Dr. Coleman said, call Bob, he's so much. It's not somebody right? You called the general surgery and called the general surgery. Surgery. I spoke to the attending right in her face. She said, I don't do that, that sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should call. She looked at who was on, and that was the guy. Actually, our policy here is to get general surgery involved because yeah. we do not have cardiothoracic at the Perkinson Hospital. So our policy that we have developed is to get general surgery involved to sort of co-evaluate, co-manage until we can get cardiothoracic surgery because they're coming from a different institution to come here. So that is our policy that we have developed here is to get general surgery involved and they can help treat the skids with cardiothoracic. A lot of times the cardiothoracic surgeon will have the surgery service do the evaluation and then communicate with them. For some yeah. reason, was that, your experience? was that your experience recently? The cardiothoracic surgery have done on surgery do the evaluation? No. Or they'll send some vascular surgeon over there. I had this happen so. just three days ago, and Dr. Parker said that the standard protocol is call the general surgery section here first, Call Dr. Bakula second and have the surgery resident call him as soon as he's evaluated the patient. Yeah, that's, I would reverse that. Yeah. Um, that's what he said. Well, he never really liked that. He has never really heard about that. Well, he was actually the second PT surgeon I called. 
because he was not supposed to be on the call with you. And that made Dr. Jahani a little bit upset. So, he got it. Yeah, well, we got to get away from that. That's a life-threatening disease process. You don't want to follow the typical chain of command in surgery. It'll take forever. Just like we talked so about with the Our responsibility is attending to attending communication, not down the resident chain. That is not the way it should go. I can tell them we had a patient in May. I saw you. I had a second. And you said to call it. We had a three, you know, alarm siren. Yeah. Nick, you, we, I spoke with Dr. Backwood, and we also spoke with him. Right. And Dr. Uh, I spoke with Cardiothoracic surgery appeared right away, didn't it? Oh, that's right. General yeah. surgery did. I spoke with Backwood from the phone, and he, yeah. <laughs> he was going to look at it. Yeah. It depends where they get affected. If you have a cardiothoracic, you have a extending order, you need to get cardiothoracic. What I'm hearing is that people have had, is that we have a policy. Maybe a slightly obscure one, a policy and a strategy that seems to work of calling the general surgery attending on call and also contacting uh, cardiothoracic. Yeah, I, I can tell you what I call the uh, surgery attending. Mm -hmm. It was a very helpful person. Mm -hmm. um, I called them for anything. He like, I can't fix that. I'll start making phone calls for you. You guys did cardiothoracic. That is not always been my experience. But okay, this was useful. I gotta move on because I got it. Less than 10 minutes. So we're gonna turn this around and cover. I'm actually not gonna finish this. Okay, so this is just stuff that cardiothoracic surgeons basically know. And if you guys have all heard, the classic Stanford A, there's clear evidence that these patients do better when they manage surgery. Isolated arch, most of us have been brought up to think of this as a surgical lesion. Actually, uh, there's been an evolution in the cardiothoracic surgery community and literature that says, well, maybe not so much. Uh, and there have been some studies that indicate that patients may actually do better with medical management of isolated arch dissections, which was kind of used to. So again, if you need a cardiothoracic surgeon to get involved, and don't be surprised with a lesion like that, they say, no, that patient's going to be managed medically. Don't, fall. Don't be too surprised if that happens. Uh, Stand for B, the baby three. As you know, most of these patients are managed medically with monitoring, which is also another way that something bad to happen, and often something bad will happen. More and more, we're seeing these patients approached in by interventional radiology, with percutaneous demonstration. Basically, what that is, is they go in, create another interval tear as they go in, and they go in and they they really do. They make another little interval tear in the area of the dissection so that the blood can have somewhere to go. Distal to the site of the plaque. And it can go back into the lumen. It decompresses the false lumen, allows the false lumen to shrink and allows the dissection to heal. And there are various ways to do the procedure. Um, this is not a procedure that I do, so the details don't really concern me. But uh, this is how an increasing number of these are being managed. And then they can get sensor graphs in addition to that. So we'll talk briefly about pharmacotherapy. I have like a whole like, semester of pharmacology in this presentation, which I never seem to get in this session. That's probably for the best. What we'll talk about is general principles and then maybe some of the attendees and people that I see can chime in with what they see happening more often or what they're doing. So, this is the ideal agent. The ideal agent for the treatment, the medical management of an acute aortic dissection, or as adjunctive management of surgery, would have these problems. We would have a rapid onset. It would have a predictable, smooth response. It would have a short half life and would be exquisitely titratable. Right? You don't want something that's going to have a half life of seven days and you can't turn it off when you need to. Right? And the patient becomes hypertensive. You should have minimal side effects and possibly capitals. It should have minimal drug interaction. It shouldn't cause any harm and delay. Right? And the best thing would be something that would reduce DPDP and heart rate in a single agent because we all know that this, the first derivative of the pressure curve with respect to time, right? Uh, reducing that increased survival and increased morbidity. 
It's just never been shown to de decrease morbidity and increase morbidity. This is a concept that's been in the literature for decades, never been demonstrated. It has been conclusively demonstrated to prevent the rupture of pygon tubes <coughs> and the progression of artificial dissections in isolated canine and aortic artery operations. It's a plastic. It is a plastic. Thank you. It's a good aortic surgery. I get struck. So this has never been proved. Nevertheless, it drives much of our conceptual approach to, therapy, to this very day. The ideal agent is therefore unobtainium propionic which is not available for most our systems. And we have to make concessions to reality when we treat patients. There is no ideal medical therapy, and not, no particular medical combination has ever been proven to be clearly superior to all others. This is what I have used in the past, and what I still reach for when I treat patients with aortic dissections, which makes me a buddy dummy, right? But I love this drug. It's a nitrobasal dilator. It has a long history of successful use in aortic dissection. Uh, it definitely increases a reflex tachycardia and needs to be used in conjunction with a block. It requires constant monitoring and special handling, but it has an exquisitely short half-life. When you turn it off, it's gone. It's beautiful. And so for the short-term stabilization of patients with acute aortic dissection, I still reach for this drug. <coughs> I'm comfortable with it. And that counts for a lot, I think. There is a potential for cyanide toxicity in patients with renal impairment, like say a baby who's not toxicating these friends in section. So you've got to be a little bit careful with that, right? But I believe it's still an excellent option for an action. Nicardipine seems to be displacing nitroprusside. It's got a rapid onset, but it's got a longer half-life. I actually have not used this in the sudden day or the section I have with other kinds of uh, clinical cases though. Uh, it's a good drug. It has minimal effects on heart rate, so the patient's not going to be as prone to a reflex type of cardiac as they would be with nitroprusside. Anybody using this preferentially in a treatment with aortic dissection? Who do you guys use? Karen? Nitroprusside? Yeah. Scott? <laughs> okay. Eric? It's either a ride on pride or uh, this nitroglycerin, I think, is okay for me. Nitroglycerin is interesting. Bob? What about the nitroglycerin? Or Asmol? Yeah, so because I'm out of time here, uh, I'm going to just a ton of drugs. Yeah, I'm going to cover. This is excellent. Uh, this is really interesting. Uh, I'm going to talk about this. 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 I'm going to talk about this really comfortable with, right? It works really well, you know, unless your patient has a renal impairment, or unless your patient is allergic to beta blockers, or, you know, has renal impairment. You know, it's not going to be perfect every time. But in general, this is the combination that I like. And, yeah, not because it's been proven to be superior in the literature, but because I'm comfortable with it, not that good experience. Yeah? Why not just use Esmol? A lot of times that's all you have to do. You start the patient on an esmolol drip, right? And you control their heart. A lot of these patients with intact heart. So you got a patient who's got a dissection, who's got a heart rate of 120 right there. That's contributing to his DPDT, which we know is clearly associated with his morbidity, right? His Tigon tubes are going to bust. So you control his heart rate with the esmolol. And a lot of times you'll find that that's all you need to do. You will have decreased his mean arterial pressure by about 20%, which is what you want to do in the first 20 to 30 minutes, right? And you're done. You don't really need to add another part, although in the atmosphere, it's needed. A lot of these patients will be extraordinarily hypertensive and controlling their heart rate will not be enough. You need to control their blood pressure as well, and that's when I reach for medical. Okay. What's your charge for a person? Because I always go 100 to 110 to go. I don't do that. I shoot for a reduction. To me, it's a hypertensive emergency. and. What I was taught a long time ago for hypertensive emergencies, and we can argue about this maybe some other time, is um, a target of decrease of mean arterial pressure of 30% in 30 minutes. Easy to remember, easy target. These patients, you know, are still subject to autoregulation, so, and I don't know how long they've been that hypertensive, so that's my, that's my goal, is a decrease of 30% in 30 minutes. 
And then lower if that's what the cardiothoracic surgeon and the intensive is more, or higher if that's what the cardiothoracic surgeon and the intensive is more. But my initial target is a decrease of heart rate, preferably to around 65 to 70, right? And a decrease in mean arterial blood pressure of 30% to 30 minutes. That's my target. And it's a real simple minded approach that's worked well. Esmolol, night five, 30% 30 minutes. Heart rate definitely below 90 to 100. I like to shoot for 70. You add analgesics at the same time. What? You add analgesics at the same time. Sure. I always, I always shoot yeah. pain. Right? Okay. Pain control is not contraindicated in patients with aortic dissection, quite the contrary. Because the DPDT, remember? Right. I'm out of time, but I can take maybe a question, Matt, with your four minutes. Anybody? Well, I'm going to rush across town and talk to those GMI.